Hello, everybody, and welcome to the UGA Alumni Association's Ask Me Anything. I'm Matt Auer. I'm the Dean of the School of Public and International Affairs at UGA, and I'm delighted today to have joining me Charles Bullock, who is the Richard B. Russell Professor, University Professor, and Josiah Meggs Distinguished Professor of Political Science at the School of Public and International Affairs. And our topic today and we invite your thoughts and your questions for Dr. Bullock is about COVID-19 and politics and with that I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Bullock. Thank you Matt, pleasure to be here and uh, be able to interact with some of our alums. I have a few statements I'll make about what the coronavirus is meaning to Georgia and some of these are pretty obvious I think. You know, One of the first things that uh, the virus did was it delayed the presidential preference primary we were supposed to have back in back in March, which might have played some role in the Democratic side. Well, we've, it's been delayed into oblivion. <laughs> we're still going to have it. You know, we're still going to be able to vote on that if you want to, but it's going to be completely meaningless by this point. Something else is done is that it has brought voting by mail to the foreground. Now, we've, Georgia for 15 years has had a, a kind of a, a no excuse vote by mail, but anybody could do this. But we've seen a lot more people want to go and vote early in person, but not this year. You don't want to run that risk. So the Secretary of State has sent out more than a million and a half ballots. They probably will send out still some more. About half a million have come back in. So it means a million, million of us have these absentee ballots at our homes. We need to get those in. You have to have that delivered to the election office in your county by election day, not just postmark, but you need to have it delivered there. And one of the consequences of that is going to be that we may well not know the results of a lot of these elections that night. Now, usually we can stay up late, uh, go online and find out who won the nominations, but it's going to take a long time to count these ballots. So we may be days later getting all of these, these counted. Uh, it looks like with all the interest that's been expressed by people requesting uh, absentee ballots, we may set a record for primary participation. Now, uh, two years ago, we only had about 1.2 million people total, and this will be both the Democrats and the Republicans. High point we've ever had is around 1.6 million. So if everybody's got an absentee ballot right now sitting on the kitchen counter, fills it out, plus those who are going and voting early, plus some folks are going to show up on election day, we'll set a record for primary participation, which, um, which is good for us. Uh, and maybe this is simply a, a step along a road to maybe see at some point down the road, Georgia move like five states have, both Democrat and Republican, to do exclusively vote by mail. Because my hunch is a lot of people gonna like doing this, find it a lot easier, so we may see that. Now, another area in which we see changes in, is in campaigning. Yeah, one of the things you are not seeing, nobody's doing door knocking. You simply aren't gonna do that which means that, you know, it used to be talk about a shoe leather campaign. Now, this would be a candidate who didn't have much in the way of resources, maybe running for a local office, maybe even a state house office. And that candidate, along with friends and family, could go out and knock on the doors of most all of the constituents. Not happening this year. Uh, these personal visits are effective. It's much more effective to have someone show up on your door and ask you to vote than to get a phone call, probably right in the middle of supper, or the least effective of all is to have your mailbox filled up with, uh, with mail outs. So we're getting the mail outs for sure, but this most effective technique of door knocking, we're not doing that. Another thing we're not having is rallies. Now we certainly know that for President Trump, you know, that is a big thing to have a big rally. Neither he nor anybody else is having those here in the primary. Uh, and then also it's taken away the opportunity for candidates to go and visit like the county Party. So go to the, say, the Walton County Republican meeting, the Clark County Democratic meeting, or to show up on campuses and meet with college Republicans or college Democrats or young Republicans. Now, what's important about those things is that candidates are able to align a volunteers by doing that, get people inspired to want to go out and work on their campaigns. So none of that is happening. And then especially if you are currently a Georgia office holder, if you are a member of the legislature, if you're a county commissioner, you can't raise money because you can't raise money while the legislature's in session. And that doesn't just mean while they're meeting in Atlanta. I mean, right now, you're still blocked from raising money. And if you're a challenger, don't hold office, you can do this, but the incumbents can't. 
nonetheless, with these other kinds of limitations, my hunch is that incumbents are probably somewhat advantaged because they have name recognition. And if you're a challenger, you're trying to get that name recognition. You'd like to have a rally. You'd like to be able to go out and knock on doors, or you'd like to be able to stand at a uh, Walmart or whatever and meet folks. Can't do any of that. Now, uh, some of the other things, I, mean, I think it's going to become important, and not so much probably here in the primary as in November, the general election, is how, how does a voter think that the coronavirus pandemic has been handled? Do you think that the government, that the elected officials have done well on this? And probably for a lot of voters, the way you're going to look at this is, is going to be determined by your partisanship. That if you're a Republican, you probably think the president's done a good job. You probably think the governor has done a good job. If you're a Democrat, you're probably much more critical of this. Uh, and we've seen some of this come through in some of the polling. Uh, there has been the uh, the polling which asked about uh, the opening up of the state. You know, Georgia was about the first state to open up, and that was not well received before it was done. Now, uh, about 60% of Georgians thought it was open, Georgia opened up too soon, but if indeed we don't see uh, an increase in illness and death, then undoubtedly a lot of voters are going to say, well, the governor took the right step. He did the right thing, and they're going to reward him for that. Um, another impact, too, has been that with this coronavirus, as we all know, the economy has just been shot, shot apart. Uh, people aren't working, they're losing jobs, or they're on shorter hours. Uh, you know, Delta Airlines, about half its airplanes are, are parked and not being used. Uh, so this, this is a, a huge impact on the economy of the state and of the nation. Now nationally, a president who's seeking re-election and the economy is, is doing well, gets re-elected. And, and certainly President Trump hoped to be able to run on record low unemployment figures, which is what we had back before this, back in February, and on a strong stock market. Well, the stock market has recovered somewhat, but employment has not. When the economy has been bad, presence of loss, and this would be true all the way back to Herbert Hoover, but also true for Jimmy Carter in 1976, and for George W.H. Bush in 1992. Bad economy, bring in somebody new. Now, the thing we hear in politics, and that is that voters don't hire challengers, but they may fire incumbents. So really, in terms of the presidential election, what this all may boil down to is whether the president's handling of the coronavirus, has that been a firing offense? All right, there going to be enough people who say they're unhappy with it and want to bring in someone new. So that's going to have, have a huge impact as I say, in November, although not really much, so much so probably here in the primary. Now, to put this context of where Georgia is in all of this, in Georgia, we were doing this 10 years ago, we'd say Georgia is a, it's a blood red state. You know, it's very Republican. Now, I think uh, people would say Georgia is a state that tilts Republican. Yeah. I mean, all of our statewide elected officials are still Republicans, but the margins are getting closer. Margins are getting closer. Last time Georgia voted for a Democrat for president was back in 1992. That's the only time since 1980. And since 1992, things were a little bit strange because we had Ross Perot who siphoned off about 13% of the vote. Otherwise, probably uh, George W.H. Bush would have, uh, would have carried Georgia if he lost it. For the last time even uh, any non-incumbent Democrat has won in Georgia statewide, we have to go back generation back to 1998. But having said all that, nonetheless, we see change. So the high water point in terms of a Republican winning by a huge margin, presidential election, that was 2004, where uh, George W. Bush got reelected by a margin of about 550,000 votes. And in below the presidency, the, the biggest margin came in two years later, 2006, when um, Governor Deal was reelected by a little over 400,000 votes. Then in 2014 and 2016, the margin, again, sizable margin for Republicans, but it shrunk to about 200,000 votes. Then, of course, gubernatorial election two years ago, that was shrunk down to 55,000 votes. So the trend has been for, yes, Republicans still win, 
but they have much less of a margin to do so. And, and accompanying this, as we also saw in 2018, that the sixth congressional district flipped. It had been Republican for many, many years. And then Lucy McBath, a Democrat, won that. And over in the adjacent seventh district there in Gwinnett and Forsyth counties, very, very close election, one of the closest in the nations. Rob Woodall, the Republican, won again, the incumbent, but by a margin, I believe it was 433 votes. And then if we dropped down even lower than that, we saw that in the Atlanta metro area, 14 House seats and two Senate seats that had been held by Republicans flipped and uh, were won by, won by Democrats. So you know, wherever we look below just kind of this simple, you know, who's winning statewide, once we look below that, we see that the Georgia's changing. And what's bringing about the change is change in, in the makeup of the electorate. Now, one of the major changes here has been in the race or ethnicity of the electorate. If we go back to again, a generation, go back to 1996, more than three-fourths of all the votes in Georgia were cast by whites. In 2018, that figure is right around maybe even a little bit below 60%. And minority voters in Georgia and nationwide vote Democratic. African Americans often hit around 90% Democratic. Uh, Hispanics, Asians, uh, more two-thirds, three-fourths Democratic. So as the electorate becomes more diverse, it becomes more Democratic. Uh, from the Michelle Nunn Senate campaign of, um, of uh, six years ago, kind of a rule of thumb came out, and that is for a Democrat to win in a state like Georgia, win statewide, you'd have a 30-30 election. And that meant that African Americans would cast 30% of all votes, and that a Democrat would get that strong African American support plus 30% of the white vote. Now, had Stacey Abrams gotten 30% of the white vote, she would have won. She got about 24, 25%. But over in Alabama in 2017, when Doug Jones won that gubernatorial, excuse me, that Senate election, it was a 30 30 election. African Americans cast 30% of the votes, he got 30% of the white votes. So, same kind of thing could happen in Georgia in our presidential election this fall or our Senate elections this fall if that were to happen. Now, another change is this is generation replacement. Old folks die, newer voters come of age. And what we're really seeing, to, to do a bit, maybe a bit of a hyperbole here, is that Republicans are dying and their grandchildren are voting Democratic. That the youth vote in Georgia is now pretty solidly a Democratic vote. In both 2016, 2018, uh, well over 60% of, of young people voted for, for the Democrats. Republicans did best among the oldest voters. Those were 16 over. And then another element that comes in is urban versus rural Georgia. We certainly saw that very clearly in the 2018 gubernatorial election where Governor Kemp uh, did very, very well in the rural areas. That's where he emphasized much of his effort and it paid off for him. Uh, the Democrat did quite well in urban Georgia. In the urban areas, um, it's almost a 40% margin going for, for, for Democrats. So it's again, it's one of those other elements. <clears throat> we're gonna have, of course, sir, be voting for president and we're gonna be a state which is gonna be a toss up state this year. So come this fall, we're gonna see a lot more Television advertising we've seen in previous presidential years. You know, we were a 5% different state. That is, Trump carried Georgia by about five percentage points in 20, 2016. Uh, all the commentators think it's going to be much closer. Again, probably, you know, if you had to bet, you'd bet the Republican will win, but it's going to be close. We're going to see a lot more attention here. And the polling, which is done right now, essentially shows uh, the president and uh, Joe Biden running neck and neck. We've also got polling, which is showing the same kind of thing for the Senate seat currently occupied by David Perdue, that he has been matched against each of the three major Democrats who are running for the nomination, which will be decided there in June. And each of them is running neck and neck with him. John Ossoff, some polls show slightly ahead. The others, uh, Teresa Tomlinson um, and Sarah Briggs Amico running kind of a little bit behind, but again, one of those things where it's a statistical dead heat. So we're gonna have that, another exciting thing, which we're not gonna be voting on in June, and that's gonna be the other seat, the one to which Kelly Leffler was appointed by the governor. That one we'll, we'll not vote on until November. It's gonna be a jungle primary. Uh, there are 
two major Republicans, a couple of major Democrats, if no one gets a majority there in that November election, we are going to be center stage for all politics in America and that we will have a runoff in early January to resolve that. Uh, one last thing, I guess, that is to talk a bit about what the implications of this are for, for the state's operating budget. Now, when the legislature comes back into session in, in about two weeks, three weeks, uh, the one thing the Georgia General Assembly has to do each year is to pass a budget. The House passed a budget. It's now in the hands of the Senate. But that budget that was passed by the House is essentially probably a dead letter because, well, if you remember, back in, in March and February, the big issue in the budget was, will there be a tax cut or will there be a big pay raise for teachers? We now know the answer to that. Neither. Neither of those is going to happen. Uh, instead, uh, the governor's called upon the state to cut its budget by 14%. The governor sets the revenue estimate, and the state legislature cannot appropriate more money than the governor says he expects that our revenues will bring in. So everyone's going to, have to operate under that cap uh, across the state, and probably every agency, department, there are going to be freezing, hiring freezes, uh, probably be furloughs. And that's going to work its way down to local governments, which also rely upon sales taxes. So city and county governments, school, school systems are also going to, to feel this. And so what we're going to see is um, government in Georgia operating with far fewer resources. And that probably means that it's going to be able to let, be best prepared to provide services uh, so that uh, EMT people may take them a bit longer to respond. Uh, processing of rape kits is going to take longer. Uh, classrooms and schools may become larger. Um, so wherever you look, uh, we're going to have, there are going to be problems. And if an agency or department is understaffed right now, it's going to be understaffed for the next year. And therefore, you know, if you have to renew your driver's license, it's going to take you longer now than it might have in the past. So, so these are some of the things which I at least see happening as we kind of were now what three months into the coronavirus. Uh, Dean Hour, do we have any questions? Do you have, do we spark we do, any kind indeed. of interest uh, among people are watching us? We, we do indeed, uh, Dr. Bullock. Thank you for that uh, excellent introduction. So many points of departure. Um, the ground rules here on Ask Me Anything is if you have a question, uh, if you look at the bottom of your toolbar there in the Q&A, just put your question in there and uh, we probably can't take all of them, but we'll, we'll uh, uh, send as many as we can towards uh, Dr. Bullock. So Dr. Bullock, as you know, um, uh, there have been some interesting uh, back and forths about the Republican National Convention. Uh, the president has done a little bit of needling of the uh, governor of North Carolina, uh, suggesting that maybe, you know, we don't want to have it there, the RNC. Uh, moving it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions pertains to that uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have the question, what, uh, excuse me, uh, Dr. Bullock, what do you see happening with the Republican and Democratic conventions? Do you see a possibility of going to Mar-a-Lago? <laughs> wow, yeah. Uh, the, the president was very much like that. <laughs> it's gonna be awfully hard to, to move a convention, you know. It's, an event like that requires years of prior planning, or at least a year of prior planning, not years, but year, a year off. And it'd be difficult to just pick up roots and move somewhere. Now, I guess one of the results of the pandemic is that, yeah, probably any place you wanted to move it, there'd probably an awful lot of open hotel rooms, which typically would not be the case, that you'd have to block those out. But you know, If you came to Atlanta or to Miami or somewhere, there would probably be the hotel rooms available. Would there be then a convention? which would be available. And then I guess one of the other questions would be, I think this would all depend upon kind of what the infection rates are in late August, because the Democrats will go first and the Republicans will go a week later. Uh, are they, the, the delegates who've gotten elected here during the spring are all going to show up, or will some of them, if indeed there is a spike in infections, particularly the spike in infections in the community where the convention's held, I could easily imagine a lot of people saying that's not worth it to go. But it, I think it'd be very surprising if indeed the Republican convention does get moved anyplace. 
Got another question. What might be the effect of a much harder shelter in place if the anticipated COVID-19 pandemic boomerangs and we have a big second wave? So if this were to transpire in the weeks and months ahead, what does that really mean for us in terms of politics in Georgia? Yeah, well, uh, I think what may maybe happen then, again, as we move into the general election. So right now, of course, the primary, it's all kind of either a Democrat or Republican. General election, your choice is, you know, do you like the Democrat or Republican? Uh, and with that partisan choice coming in, I would expect that if indeed conditions are have become much worse, if we're having another spike in illnesses, uh, the incumbents are the ones who are going to get blamed for this. Now, again, you know, incumbents don't cause pandemics, but for uh, a, a lot of voters, you know, if, if the shoe pinches, you want a new shoe. So if conditions, if the economy is bad and certainly a, a spike in illness and effort to kind of go back and shelter in place would kind of take the wind out of whatever uh, businesses are beginning to enjoy right now with people coming out and spending more money, uh, I would think it'd be bad for incumbents generally, bad for the, for the president nationally. Thank you for that. Uh, one of the hot button issues uh, towards the beginning of the legislative uh, session was the gaming constitutional amendment. What do you think the prospects are uh, for the reintroduction of it uh, in the midst of all of this, of this pandemic? Yeah, one of the things which we don't know, we'll have to see, you know, does the legislature simply come in, spend its entire time wrestling with where to make the cuts in the budget, which is going to be very unpleasant. You know, nobody's going to enjoy doing this because every program that you talk about has its set of people who think that it is absolutely essential that you maintain funding at its current level. So it's going to be very, very difficult. One of the elements which is going to make it even more difficult right now to go through this cutting process is the Jack Hill died. Now, folks don't know who Jack Hill was. He was one of the most important players within the legislature. He was a senator from South Georgia who had chaired the Senate Appropriations Committee since 2003. He knew more about the Georgia budget than probably anybody else on the face of the earth. So he would have been especially valuable kind of determining where cuts could be made. He died. So we've got a new chair there, very competent uh, younger legislator, but he doesn't have that institutional memory that Jack Hill had. So uh, does the legislature do, some, do anything more than simply say, let's work our way through this budget, let's see what we have to do and then go home, or are they going to be amenable to taking up issues such as casinos, horse racing, uh, sports betting? Um, what I'm told is the easiest of these to implement. Again, a, a rationale for those people who like to see any one of these is that this would be a new source of revenue, something we haven't tapped. What I'm told is the easiest of these to implement would be the, the sports betting, so that you could bet on uh, the Falcons, the Hawks, uh, UGA. That could be set in place much more easily. Now, in terms of having a casino, then it's going to be a while, I would think, before you can have a facility which is up and operating. So, um, and yeah, his answer is, I don't know, but my guess is that they're not going to move on casino gambling or horse racing. The legislature might do something about sports, sports betting. Dr. Bullock, one of your fans uh, 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 gives you a, a, a hail and a hat tip for uh, conducting this session, just like Southern politics, your course again. He feels like he's back in Southern politics. The question he has for you, just looking oh. a little bit to the west of us, is do you have any thoughts on the Jeff? Sessions and Tommy Tuberville a runoff, and, and what does that mean for them and also for Doug Jones? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, again, Alabama is, is going to be a fascinating situation. And the, the president is very much weighed in on the, the side of the former Auburn coach, you know, Tommy Tuberville. And this is just kind of the continued bad feeling that the president very rapidly developed with his, his choice to be his attorney general. Uh, <laughs> President doesn't have a good batting batting average in in Alabama. Uh, you know, in this uh, position, the other was filled uh, for the remaining two years of, of sessions older 
term, original term, uh, the president weighed in uh, and uh, was not successful in either of his efforts there to, to elect a person. Um, I, I have not uh, studied the, the polling on this, but my hunch is that probably Tuberville has the inside track unless no Alabama fans will vote for him. So I don't know, I guess that would be a, a wild card. But whoever, whichever the Republicans gets the nomination will be favored going into, into, that, into that general election. That um, the fact that Doug Jones got elected there in a state which is now much redder than Georgia, much more Republican state than Georgia is now. And the only reason that uh, Doug Jones managed to get elected there is he got to run against an alleged child molester. Now, what's strange about Alabama is that even though the Republican was an alleged child molester, it was a really close race. So there were a lot of voters who apparently were going in saying, child molester, Democrat, child molester, which, which is worse, which is worse. Uh, Jones wins by about 20,000 votes, and really probably the only reason he won that was about 20,000 people, roughly the margin of victory, wrote in somebody else. And my guess is those were all Republicans who simply could not bring themselves to vote for, for the former Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, who had been removed twice. Dr. Book, I've got a couple um, mail-in ballot questions for you. Maybe I'll give them both to you at the same time. Uh, one of the questioners writes, it seems as though voting by mail is becoming an increasingly partisan issue, with some legislators strongly advocating for in-person voting instead of allowing voters to choose mail-in ballots. Do you think there's a possibility that voting by mail for the general election in November could be restricted even, e either nationwide or state by state? And then a second, uh, alum uh, a second viewer here has asked, uh, hi, Dr. Bullock, I'm a former student of yours. I'm so happy to see and hear your voice again. Is there polling on how popular the idea of mail-in voting is in Georgia? If older voters, many of whom vote Republican, would feel safer with a mail-in ballot, would that move Republican lawmakers in Georgia to allow for ease of access to mail-in ballots? I live in Colorado and it works very well here. We can even drop them in boxes outside of courthouses, libraries, et cetera, so we don't even need to pay for a stamp. So a couple mail-in ballot questions. Huh. Yeah, it's interesting that this has become a partisan issue because Let's say for about 15 years now, Georgia has had this no fault vote by mail. You know, it used to be you had to have an excuse why you could not show up at the polling place where your business or something was taking you away. Well, last 15 years, all you have to do is ask for it. And during that 15 years, both uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party has encouraged people to vote by mail. Now, what we've seen over the last roughly 10 years or so is that Republicans actually were more likely to vote by mail than Democrats were. Democrats were more likely than Republicans to go vote early in person, go to the courthouse or one of the uh, few uh, precinct places in the two, three weeks before the election and do that. Democrats might do that. So this idea that it's uh, you know, a, a Democratic aid in having vote by mail, historically it hasn't been. Uh, I don't think that there's any chance that uh, that is going to be restricted in Georgia or nationally, uh, nationwide, it would of course take an act of Congress. Uh, in Georgia, uh, you'd also have to have a, have a legislature take action to roll back, change, change the, the rules, and I just don't see that happening. Uh, the person who's in Colorado, yeah, Colorado is one of the five states, and it's not all Democratic because Utah is another one of those five states, which have moved exclusively to vote by mail. And I'm not sure about every county. I know I live in Oconee County. I know in Oconee County, uh, you can do like the caller from, um, from Colorado said, and you can drop off your ballot if you want to in a box at, at the courthouse, as well as mailing in. Now, what I think is going to happen is that a lot of voters who have never done vote by mail may, will, will like it uh, in that, you know, there are no lines to stand in. And uh, you know, it, it's very simple. In Georgia, uh, if you're over, I think it's 65, you can check a box and you will get uh, an absentee ballot for every election within the cycle, which would mean this year you'd get it for the 
June primary, the August runoff, if there's one, the November general election, and if we have a, a runoff for that in, in January of 2021, all of those would show up for you. So I, I suspect we're going to see a lot more voters, both Democrat and Republican, uh, making use of this. Uh, as that uh, first uh, caller suggested, yeah, particularly here uh, right now, there may be a lot of older voters who are more vulnerable to the coronavirus who will decide, yeah, I don't need to go and miss my health. I'll just you know, fill out the ballot or request the ballot and send it in. Again, to stress something though, in Georgia, you have to have that ballot delivered to your county election office by 7 p.m. on election day. So you, know, you wanna make sure you don't wait till the last minute to mail it. Uh, I believe you can take it and drop it off at a precinct on election day if you've kind of put it aside and at the last minute you discover you still have it there. Now, some other states simply require that it be postmarked by election day. In Georgia, it has to be received by the end of election day. One last follow-up question on mail-in ballots. The question is, is there any evidence, what do the studies show as to whether mail-in ballots increase incidences of voter fraud? Um, yeah, the, the thought has been that it'd be easier to do this, that you go out and term as harvest ballots, so that you might uh, request a number of them and then stand over people as they, they vote them or something like this. The only really recent example of serious voter fraud using mail-in ballot, mail ballots actually was perpetrated by a Republican it was over in the ninth district of, of North Carolina. It took place just two years ago where there was a Republican campaign uh, operative who was indeed harvesting ballots, uh, apparently filling them in at some, some times like this. And so the state election office in North Carolina threw out that election. This was a congressional election. The Republican won it by less than a thousand votes, but the election was thrown out. Uh, and even the winner ultimately said, yeah, you ought to throw it out. So even the winner didn't have had much confidence in it. And then they had to have a special election. But that's um, the only major uh, example uh, recently in which uh, there's been widespread fraud with regard to um, bail ballots. Got a question now for you about political polling. The questioner writes, speaking of polling, we saw in the last election, and I think we're talking about 2016, we saw in the last election how wrong the polls were, even when aggregated. What are or should pollsters be doing to fix this for the upcoming elections? Yeah, it's becoming increasingly difficult to do polling. Uh, you know, all of us now have caller ID on our phone, so you know, a lot of us are just going to not respond if we don't recognize who it is that's calling us. And even people respond uh, may not once they find it's a pollster may hang up or hang up part way through it. So it's becoming increasingly difficult to, to get good polling. Uh, one of the ways around this is um, doing online polling, but uh, where you've got a sample of people. So not just something where you say, like uh, sometimes on the evening news, you know, here's a question, uh, call in, you know, punch one for yes and two for no. Okay, I clearly those things uh, have, have kind of no reliability. They may actually be accurate, but they're not reliable. Uh, so the polling business has got, got serious kinds of problems. Now, the kind of polling that's done uh, nationally came out reasonably accurate. And, and again, if you're trying to predict who's going to win nationwide, yeah, and I predicted a, a narrow democratic victory, and that's essentially what it was in the popular vote. In terms of getting down to uh, state by state, yeah, uh, what determined the outcome was those three Midwest states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and, uh, and uh, uh, Wisconsin. And uh, those were determined by some of about 70,000 votes. So again, pollsters will tell you. And again, if you read that fine print underneath the polling, it always tells you what the margin of error is. And so you know, if indeed candidate A has got right now in your poll 46% and candidate B is 45%, you know, no pollster would say, expect candidate A to win. They would simply say, this is a statistical dead heat. We really can't tell you. We can. You know, say it, we would be, wouldn't be surprised, you know, if it's a 3% margin that could be, you know, 48, 42, it could actually be reversed or whatever. So there's, there's always that aspect of polling and any pollster, you know, will warn you about that. Question back again to the uh, issue of the conventions that are coming up. Uh, the questioner writes, it seems like President Trump wants a full haul 
what do you think about those conventions and social distancing and what are these conventions going to look like? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that's interesting to observe about a president is that uh, presidents you know, get, get to set the agenda for what they do. And a president will do what he thinks, what he likes to do and what he thinks he's good at. And so one of the things that Trump has really liked doing is having these huge rallies. And he's staged those throughout his, his tenure as president, as well as having many of them during his, his campaign. So that's what he would really like to do, just as uh, President Obama, what he liked to do was give speeches. And so he was, you know, did a lot of that. So yeah, President Trump would very much love to have uh, convention hall packed, bodies, you know, <laughs> body to body, no space in between. And of course, that's the antithesis of, of social distancing. Uh, if, if indeed the uh, incidence of infection is way down, uh, I suspect that then we're more likely to see something like that taking place. Uh, it, you know, just we saw this last weekend and some uh, events necessarily in Georgia. I know there was some film out of Texas and some out of Missouri which was showing uh, you know, people just socializing, you have a great time uh, being in close proximity, you might see that. Uh, if, uh, on the other hand, you know, we've, it's not been a V, but a W, where we've got another uh, incidence of higher uh, uh, disease, um, I would think we wouldn't see that, that even the Republican primary, that uh, convention rather, that you're just simply gonna see it. You know, they're gonna try to do something. Now, maybe I guess, I guess you couldn't even do that. I say you could go to like a uh, major stadium uh, and you could certainly pay, have a lot of people there and space them out um, for something that, you know, UGA and other football teams may be thinking about this fall too. It's, it's kind of how to do that. Now we have an interesting question about um, the politics of Joe Biden's running mate, running mate selection. So the question is, might the success or failure of Governor Kemp's reopening plan help or hurt Abrams's and Lance Bottoms's chances of being tapped as the Democratic VP candidate? Mm, interesting, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, Abrams, of course, has been a major critic of, of the governor and ran against him and has continued her criticisms, not so much in terms of, uh, of his decisions to open the state up, but continued to criticize his, essentially his job as, um, as Secretary of State. But both of those, or certainly uh, the mayor of Atlanta, uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms, would be front and center in terms of someone criticizing the governor who opened up the state before any, a state before anyone else. So if indeed, then that's going to be something that um, the Biden wants to stress on the camp campaign. And again, depending upon what conditions look like, uh, I guess he'll probably have to make his decision probably in late July and it'll have been early August. Uh, that might influence him. Now, something else to say about this, you know, mentioned these two African-American women, and we do know it's going to be a woman. I don't know if it'll be African-American, but Joe Biden has said he's going to, going to tap a woman. If either of them ends up running for vice president, that, I think, would have a dramatic impact upon what happens then in elections here in Georgia. That would pump up African-American participation to unheard of levels, which would work to the advantage of the Democrats running for the two Senate seats, would also work to the advantage of the Democrats in District 6 and 7, the two congressional districts there, as well as Democrats who are competing to try to take control of the state house. That's something I didn't mention earlier, but in terms of Georgia politics, one of Democrats' top goals is to flip the state house. And to do that, they would have to get a net gain of 16 seats in the state house. Uh, there are about that many marginal seats that Republicans won in 19, excuse me, in, in 2018. Uh, so to flip that, yeah, Democrats have to win all of those, plus also hold on to a number of seats that they won in 2018, but won very narrowly. So, you know, tapping either any, any Georgia woman, putting her on the, the ticket for vice president, certainly has very great implications for how elections are likely to result in Georgia. 
question about the U.S. Census. It's delayed. Is that going to have an impact on redistricting in Georgia? Uh, it will have an impact nationwide if they don't get the numbers out when they usually do. Now, yeah, the census is, you know, hypothetically, it is a number of people in the United States on April 1st of year divisible by four. And then the Census Bureau gets those numbers back to the state so that states can think about redrawing their districts uh, right at the very end of the year. Now, now, this is the first year they've tried to do most of the census online. Uh, they're prepared to send people out to, 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 again, do door knocking to track down households that don't respond. And if you notice, if you saw any of those ads, which used to pop up uh, kind of when you're working on the internet, the individuals that they showed going out and doing those jobs look like retirees. Now, those folks, I think, are going to be very reluctant again to sign up to go out and try to track down people who hadn't bothered to send in their census forms. So, going to cause new problems, I think, in completing the census. Now, if another part of the implication of this question was, you know, is there going to be a question about whether or not Georgia picks up a 15th congressional seat, uh, all the, none of the projections show that we will. Uh, we will be several hundred thousand people short of that. At least those are the projections. And what the people who do who make these things, a man named Kimball Brace is very, very good at this, been doing it for 40 years. And he goes through and kind of ranks, you know, What's each going to be number 430, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35? Of course, 35 is the last seat. Then he also projects on down. And where Georgia comes in, we're around somewhere around 445. So we're, we're not right on the cusp of getting that 15th seat. So we probably are not going to pick up another seat. But we will have to go through and redraw all of our congressional districts, all of our state legislative districts. What will probably happen will be that the governor will call a special session of the legislature long in August or maybe September of 2021 to do that. If there's a delay in getting those census figures, oh, that might push that back further into the fall. Dr. Bullock, a couple of questions on judgeships. How effective are campaign mailers or personal telephone calls in local judicial races, given that candidates cannot campaign in person? And then secondly, do you think Georgia will move towards instituting more elected judgeships or go the other way and seek to have more Georgia judges appointed? Okay. Yeah, judges have been told by this by the Supreme Court that yeah, you, 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 you can go out and campaign. It used to be thought that judges didn't campaign at all. That they you know, simply got to you know, put their name out and run on the record. I think it is still the case that a judge cannot be present and collect campaign contributions. Uh, the judge, again, if we were having meetings where a judge, or someone could have a house party and invite a judicial candidate and then invite neighbors and friends in, that the judge could make a pitch, but we would have to leave and someone else would have to collect, collect the money. So it does make campaigning by judges difficult. Also, judges are not supposed to tilt their hand, tip their hand rather, and say how they would rule on various kinds of cases. They're supposed to be completely unbiased. So judges doing mail outs, particularly right now, is about the only way they can get their name out. They also have a, a challenge in that unless you're an attorney, you probably don't care a whole lot about who a judge is. Now, clearly, if you're an attorney, you might if you're practicing in court regularly. So for most voters, you know, these show up way down on the, once you've gone through a lot of the, the ballot and you, know, you get there and you don't recognize the names, chances are you maybe just fall back and vote for the incumbent. So it is difficult for, for judges to, to run effective campaigns. It's probably even more, effective, more difficult if you're someone who's running against a sitting judge to get your message out and why you know, voters should prefer you over someone who's been in office. So we don't see a whole lot of judges who get defeated. Indeed, a lot of our judges don't even draw opposition. Now, so the other question about um, what Choice of judges. Well, here in Georgia, all of our judges are elected from our state Supreme Court to the Court of Appeals to our superior courts. And if your county has a, uh, a state court, that judge is also elected. The chief magistrate, if you have one of those in your county, is also elected. All the other magistrates are, but the chief magistrate is. So we're very much an election state. Back in, this would have been early 1990s, Governor Miller tried through an executive order 
to move Georgia to what's called the Missouri Plan. Now, under the Missouri Plan, governors appoint judges, they serve a term, and then they run on the record. So the ballot would say, shall Judge Mary Smith serve another term? Yes, no. And if most people vote check yes, Mary Smith does another term. If they check no, then the governor would appoint a replacement. The governor said, that's what we're going to move to. Someone went to court and challenged it, and it turns out the governor didn't have the authority to do that. I haven't heard of any talk, serious talk, about moving towards, towards a plan like this. You know, our South Carolina, it's actually the legislature that chooses judges, and I certainly haven't heard anybody talk about doing that in Georgia either. So I think we're probably going to continue with our practice where we elect our judges. Now, what's the kind of the interesting wrinkle on that is that if there's a vacancy, the governor gets to fill it by appointment. If you create a new superior court judgeship, and every year if you are done that, the governor gets appointed. So most of our judges come to the bench, not because they were elected, defeated a candidate, or because it was an open seat, but because the governor appointed them. And right now there's some controversy over, you know, what the governor's going to make some appointments, excuse me, uh, to, I guess, at least two positions in the state Supreme Court. So here's a big question. Um, who do you expect to win in the presidential contest nationally? <laughs> well, uh, as I say, given the, the economic conditions and uh, assuming that they're not going to get a whole lot better. Let me say one other thing about this. There have been political scientists who, who game this, who, who make projections. About uh, eight or ten of them, uh, two of them have been on the faculty at UGA at one point or another. Neither of them is here right now. Um, and they look at uh, two, a couple of elements, invariably. One of them is how popular is the president? What's the president's approval rating? You know, more people say the president doing a good job or bad job. And then another element they look at is some kind of measure of the state of the economy. And different scholars use different measures of the economy. But an interesting thing about this measure of the economy, invariably what they take is almost always the second quarter. Right? We're roughly halfway through the second quarter of this year. Uh, so taking those two elements, right now, uh, you know, conditions don't look good for the president. And I said earlier, when the economy is bad, that's when we tend to find presidents who, who fail to get reelected. Now, you know, usually presidents do get a second term uh, within kind of, I mean, virtually anybody's lifetime who's around. Uh, the two who didn't were Jimmy Carter and uh, George W.H. Bush, and that's both uh, suffered uh, having a bad economy. And what's really interesting, again, this thing about George W.H. Bush fits in with this pattern political science doing, is that by November of 1992, the economy was actually turning around. So it wasn't the bottom of the economy. Things were getting better. But again, if voters were making their minds, the, the independent voters, the swing voters, back in you know, April, May, June, yeah, they'd already kind of written him off. And of course, another one there was you had Ross Perot, who siphoned off about 20% of the vote. So I don't think we're going to have anything like that this year. Uh, but um, you know, right now, it does not look particularly good for, for President Trump. So Dr. Bullock, we've talked uh, briefly about the two Senate races in Georgia. We've talked a little bit about Doug Jones in Alabama. Any other uh, races that you recommend that we uh, keep tabs on around the South? Around the South? Oh, OK. Uh, <laughs> OK, well, in terms of presidential contests, um, not only is Georgia going to be interesting, but so are Florida and, uh, and North Carolina. Now, all the lot of talk in the national media about what I would call a northern path to the presidency. And as I said earlier, the critical states in electing Donald Trump in 2016 were that he flipped three Democratic states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Okay. So the northern route would say, all right, you know, the president holds on to those, he gets reelected. But for a Democrat, there may also be a Southern route. And sure, if the Democrat sweeps those, it's probably Democrat wins. But if a Democrat were to win Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, those bring even more electors than those three Northern states. Indeed, Florida and either one of those, Florida and Georgia, Florida and North Carolina, get you more electoral college votes than those three Northern states. North Carolina voted for Barack Obama in 2008. Florida voted Democratic in 2008 and 2012, and of course was a dead heat in 2000, and voted uh, Democratic in 1996. Uh, each of these three states is becoming more Democratic, again, if you look at just kind of you know, 
narrowness of winds, things like this. So uh, those are going to be states to keep, keep an eye on. Also, we should get returns on election night in November earlier from these three states because they're all three in the Eastern time zone. So you, know, and you may remember in 2016, the thought was that if Florida were to go for Hillary Clinton, then it's all over, turn out the lights. Well, it didn't. You know? And uh, it did then set in motion what, what happened elsewhere. In terms of a nearby Senate race, maybe the, what's perceived to be the, the tightest Senate race in the nation is just across our, our North Georgia border in North Carolina. Tom Tillis, who won fairly narrowly in 20, uh, 2014, uh, North Carolina elected Democratic governor in 2016. That is very close. Uh, the uh, Alabama race, yeah, it's going to get a lot of attention. I say it probably goes back to, to the Republicans. Mm. And those are probably the ones which are really in play here within the South. Uh, the Tillis race, I said, is uh, seen as being one of the most competitive. Uh, I think it is Stu Rothenberger, and again, he's one of these people who spends his whole lifetime studying and anticipating elections. He has put uh, Kelly Loeffler's, Loeffler's seat in, I think he ranks at number six in terms of making her the sixth most endangered sitting senator. Recently, uh, as you know, there's been a little bit of a scrap between the president and the CEO of Twitter. Um, we have a question that's related yeah. to that. With, the, with COVID accelerating the shift away from the, quote, public square towards online platforms as a place where political, political battles take place, how do you see social media companies playing a role in the 2020 presidential election compared to 2016? How might companies like Facebook, Twitter, Google, et cetera, change their behavior from 2016? Yeah, I guess the real question would be, we saw, I guess the reason I guess this comes up is that, uh, it was yes, yesterday, uh, Twitter uh, kind of put a, a warning out about some of the things the president was saying. So it's kind of like what newspapers have been doing for some time, where they do a fact check on uh, kind of Twitter was doing that, and the president was very angry that they raised some questions about his, some of his statements. So I think the issue is going to be, you know, does Facebook do that? Do the other... Uh, uh, social media also then present a warning or maybe even do like the, the newspapers do, you know, where they would come out and I guess the worst thing they would say about you was pants on fire. They thought it was a complete lie. Um, so that would, that would inject the, the social media um, into a new role, which we certainly didn't see in 2016. Of, of, rather than just kind of being available, anybody can say it, at least carrying some kind of caveat at the bottom and saying, hmm, yeah, there's an alternative perspective or, you know, this may not be entirely true. So I think that's going to be something interesting to watch and see if they do adapt that new role. Looks like Twitter will. Well, Dr. Bullock, you've uh, answered almost 20 questions. I think we have time for one more. African-American support for Biden was high in the primaries. Can we expect the same in the general election if Biden selects a Latina or Caucasian woman as VP running mate? Yeah, well, I think it certainly would be higher if he, if he chose a Hispanic, I mean, excuse me, if he chose a black woman. Um, and one of the things that's got to be at the back of his mind is the experience that Hillary Clinton had. Now, Hillary Clinton was not that popular among African Americans. So nationwide and in Georgia, black participation dropped off substantially. Now, certainly she got the great bulk, you know, and roughly 90% of the votes which were cast by African Americans, but she was relatively unsuccessful in mobilizing the black vote. In Georgia, she was much less successful than Barack Obama was, or than, uh, say, Jason Carter was, for example, or, uh, so, or Michelle Nunn. So one of the things that it's probably critical for, for Biden is to have strong African-American participation. Um, it, it, it would be strong this week if he tapped someone like uh, Stacey Abrams. Um, if black voters are sufficiently unhappy and concerned about what they have seen in the Trump administration, then I suspect there will, will be strong black turnout uh, regardless of whom, whom Biden taps. But this is, you know, as I say, about a president, about the choice of the vice president is the first important or first tremendously important decision 
they that a presidential nominee makes and has potential to make or break. Uh, and so I assume that uh, Biden, these handles are going to be giving extended and serious consideration and trying to weigh all the factors in, in this and the pros and cons. Dr. Bullock, I want to thank you very much. Um, I've received my absentee ballot and I'd be inclined to write you in somewhere for one of the races, but I actually <laughs> need to teach in the fall. So I'm going to uh, restrain myself. But thank you for this really excellent hour of uh, conversation about uh, the pandemic, politics in Georgia. Um, we'll be signing off. I want to thank the, uh, the University of Georgia Alumni Association for hosting uh, the Ask Me Anything program and this session. And I believe the session is recorded and the Alumni Association will be in touch, in fact, with, with folks who are on this call uh, to let them know about that and some other things. Thanks so much.